Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for joining the Law Office of Edward Newbles webinar discussing the Liberian Refugee Immigration Fairness Act, simply put, the LRIF. My name is Iris Annan, and I'm a case manager at the Law Office, and I'll be your facilitator today. The law firm has been operating for the past 16 years, advising and representing clients in all the 50 states and overseas in matters of US immigration law, immigration fraud, terrorism and security related immigration issues, family and business immigration, workforce compliance, waivers of inadmissibility, citizenship, among others. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide an overview of the LRIF legislation, outline its importance and the processes required. The speaker for today is the founder and managing attorney of the firm. Attorney Newell is a graduate of Washington and Lee University School of Law. He is an experienced trial lawyer, a skilled negotiator, and passionate about immigration law. He is a frequent speaker at immigration legal conferences and is sought after by other immigration attorneys to advise and provide his opinion on the ever-changing immigration law. I entreat you to use the Q&A tab to send your questions across as we go through the webinar. We have resource materials available and the link to access these materials has been shared in the chat room. We also have staff members on the chat ready to answer questions in Spanish, French, and Swahili. Please feel free to message them. Thank you and again, welcome to the webinar for the LRIF. Attorney Newell, I am ready when you are. Thank you very much again. And also uh, to you all, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I look forward to speaking with you and engaging with you and just providing you all with a brief overlay of the Liberian refugee uh, provision. Um, and so again, welcome. And I thank you. The format of this webinar will be in the form of a dialogue. Uh, we feel best that uh, we can get to the heart and the meat of the uh, provision as well as some of uh, maybe to clarify some of the things uh, that we've heard um, as well. Um, as you know, on December 20th, 2019, President Donald Trump signed into law the National Defense um, Operation Act for fiscal year uh, 2020. Uh, included in that National Defense Act was, was a provision uh, which is now dubbed the Liberian uh, refugee um, immigration fairness, which provides an opportunity for Liberians and their families uh, to obtain green card status in the United States. Um, and subsequently, upon uh, being approved for those green card and lawful permanent resident status, uh, those Liberians and the family members can immediately apply for naturalization. Um, I don't need to tell you uh, how important that is. Uh, prior to the signing of this into law, there was a big push uh, by members of the Liberian nonprofits um, as well uh, to extend the uh, DED uh, status for many Liberians who are in the US for many years. Mm -hmm. And so this provision, uh, you know, not only provides permanent legal status for Liberians and their family members, mm -hmm. but also is a pathway to citizenship, which is very important. So um, at this time, I will, uh, you know, we will then start uh, engaging in a dialogue, mm -hmm. asking questions um, as to uh, what is uh, the LRF, uh, what is the LMRIF, um, as well as uh, some issues that we can clarify. Um, as we speak and things come up, uh, please feel free to use the uh, chat box and we'll be sure to address uh, your questions uh, either during or at the end of uh, the webinar. Uh, so Ms. Anon, please, um, I'm ready when you are. Okay, I, I have my clipboard ready with all my questions and then once I'll go through a couple of the questions and then after that we'll go into open session and see what 
um, questions we have from our audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first question I have for you is, who is eligible to apply for the LRIF? Okay, eligible, so Liberians, nationals, well, Liberian nationals who were present in the United States mm -hmm. uh, on uh, November 21st, 2014, mm -hmm. um, are eligible. And those who can show that they were continuously present uh, in the United States, November 21st, 2014, those are the Liberians that are eligible uh, mm -hmm. and can submit the applications, um, as well as their spouses uh, and uh, unmarried children and also their minor uh, children. Right, okay. This question may sound a bit elementary, but who is a Liberian national? Okay, good question, because a Liberian national uh, is uh, defined as a person born in Liberia, mm -hmm. uh, and those maybe who have naturalized, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as well. So a Liberian national, you know, could be someone who has acquired another nationality, mm -hmm. but was born in Liberia and has proof of their Liberian nationality. Um, I... Um, I kind of look at it differently from citizenship versus mm -hmm. nationality. And so uh, those who may have dual nationality or another nationality uh, other than Liberia would fall under the qualification of who is a Liberian national. Of course, if you also naturalize as a Liberian, you also qualify as a Liberian national. Those are some of the evidence that you have to show. Right, but you do need to show documentation that establishes that you are a Liberian national. All right. Definitely, definitely. You definitely have to show. Uh, for those who are on the Liberian DD and TPS in the, uh, I mean, the past, uh, they you know, had to also show uh, proof of their Liberian nationality. So uh, those are folks who already have on the record you know, their proof. But of course, uh, mm -hmm. those Liberian or Liberians who qualify are those who also may not have been or may not apply for TPS or DED, but meet the requirements as being in the U.S. Uh, in November 21st, 2014. Right. Okay. So I'm guessing documents like your birth certificate, your Liberian passport, is some of the documents we are looking at. Correct. And USCIS, uh, you know, has made some suggestions such as, you know, like you said, the birth certificate, uh, the uh, passport, um, or those are some of the documentation that you can provide. Of course, uh, depending on how long a person has been in the U.S., as well as the circumstances on how they came to the U.S., may also dictate on the availability of those documentation. Um, USCIS has a list of secondary documentation or proofs that you can provide should you not have those primary documents. But in essence, you need to prove your Liberian nationality. Okay, so I am a Liberian nationality, I qualify. Or are there some ineligibility requirements? Oh, sure, yes, definitely. So um, in simple terms, uh, those who um, have had run-ins uh, with the law, uh, mm -hmm. Criminal records. Uh, certain criminal records uh, will prevent you from benefiting. So, mm -hmm. if you engage in a crime of violence, uh, a crime where the sentence is more than one year, uh, those are crimes uh, that may trigger uh, right. the bar. Uh, mm -hmm. The most important thing is that uh, when you're looking at the criminal convictions, uh, and determining whether or not they form a bar uh, to any application for adjustment of status is to consult with a lawyer to make sure that those crimes do, in fact, will make you, uh, will, will prevent you, uh, you know, from applying. Secondly, in a, uh, apart from that, there are other crimes also, like theft, uh, identification theft, or maybe reckless driving, DUI, depending on what state you are in, and depending on um, how the law is framed, or even sometimes uh, the facts of the case may also pre prevent you from uh, applying for this provision, especially if you have two or more. Um, 
Also, if you, and specifically in the Liberian context, if you participated in the Liberian Civil War and there's evidence of that, that will bar you from applying. So whether or not, you know, you're a child soldier, you're a rebel, you were part of a group that advocated um, and it's found that you, that your group or that you actually persecuted uh, people depending on the race, the nationality, their tribal group, uh, you will, this will prevent you um, from applying or from receiving um, legal status from this provision. Right. Please let me remind our audience that you can send your questions across on the Q&A tab in, in, in the webinar. Please feel free to send any question that you have available to the attorney and he's more than ready to assist you to answer these. Tenuvo, I know that there are some public charge requirements against um, people who are applying for green cards. Mm -hmm. Does this public charge requirement also affect the LRIF application? Okay, and so the public charge, uh, I guess you're referring to is those who have received maybe food stamps, have gotten food stamps, mm -hmm. and things like that. Generally speaking, when a person is applying for their green card, uh, they have to show that once they enter the U.S., or once they once they become a green card holder, that they that they're able to support themselves, that they won't need any assistance from the state, the federal government, or any things like that. If there's evidence that your sponsor or that you don't have enough funds to support yourself, of course, then the application is denied. In the LRF context, that is waived. Um, and so, even if you receive food stamps or you receive assistance or anything down the line. Mm -hmm. um, that will not prevent you from being granted. Uh, that public charge also comes along with uh, three other um, things that are waived. And the most relevant is also those who entered without uh, proof. I mean, those who came uh, through the US and they didn't go through the proper uh, you know, channels. Those who enter lawfully but have lost their passport or proof that they enter the U.S. Uh, the provision waives that, so you don't have to prove how you enter um, the U.S. or that you actually lawfully enter the U.S. Uh, when you say you did. Right, okay. And I know, Attorney Nevo, that, well, my little understanding of immigration law is that if you want to apply for a green card, that is to say, if you want to adjust status in the United States, you have to so proof of entry. Is that what you were talking about just now? That's correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. well, the general rule is that for those who can't show proof, then they will have to leave the U.S. and complete the process, uh, you know, from home. And mm -hmm. as we all know, once you depart the U.S., then you have a bar of 10 years that you can't come back and you have to file a waiver depending on, uh, you know, who's applying for you. In this case, that, that is waived. Um, in this uh, provision. Okay. What about attending your vote, spouses and children of Liberian nationals? Must they necessarily be li Liberians to qualify under the LRIF? No, not at all. And that's the, I, I guess that's the very broad and liberal mm -hmm. of this provision. You do not have to be a Liberian. Um, you also don't have to show that you are in the US um, as of the date of November 21st, 2014. Um, you know, the main thing is that you must be married at the time you, know, you submit the application. But for the most part, um, you know, as, as long as the primary relative, which is the Liberian national, um, is applying or has applied, uh, and you're the spouse, the minor child, the adult, unmarried um, uh, child, mm -hmm. uh, then you can benefit and apply. Okay, so I'm, a, uh, I'm from Cameroon, I'm from Ghana, I'm married to a Liberian, I am eligible, simply put. You are, you are you're, you're in, you're in. Now, of course, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, I mean, also the public charge mm -hmm. and all the other things that would not apply to your spouse will not apply to you, but you also have to still qualify. And I say qualify because apart from what has been waived in terms of the public charge, food stamps, 
you know, proof of how you came in. There are other uh, bars or things that will prevent one from getting a green card, such as, mm -hmm. as you, um, have you lied before? Have you submitted documents that were not truthful? Those are things that will come up and you will have to deal with either ask the Liberian national or ask the spouse or the children of the Liberian that is applying. Okay, and they also don't need to show that they've been here from November 20th, 2014. Correct. Right, okay. Correct. And what is the deadline for the application? Okay, so the deadline, the application has to be received by USCIS December 20th, 2020. That's, that is referred to in the legal setting, the sunset date. Um, not to be confused as being postmark on December 20th, 2020. Uh, there's been some argument in the legal circle as uh, trying you know, to extend that or make sure that as long as the application is mailed or postmarked, mm -hmm. uh, my advice is that get it out way in advance so that it's delivered. If you send it, send it by a certified mail, USP, uh, USPS priority mail where you have tracking and proof, Federal Express UPS. Uh, you want to have evidence of that and also make a copy of the application and the tracking number as well. Right. Okay. Thank you. Attending that is that you want it with you, you want it out of your hands into USCIS December 20th. Come December 19th, you don't want to have to be worried about having to send it. So, you know, if the deadline says December 20th, I said, I said set, set a personal deadline to get it out by December 15th so that it is out in um, and completed. Right, you, you wouldn't want to miss the December 20th, 2020 deadline. Correct, correct, correct. And you know, and if you're doing it by yourself, I would mm -hmm. say definitely send it in way, in way in advance by November. So if and when, if there's any rejection or if mm -hmm. there's something you missed, then you have enough time to correct it and resend it. Um, you know, there's, you know, I don't even know if the argument can be made that if it's rejected and it's past the deadline and you have to resubmit it, how that will work. Right. There might be legal arguments that would be pushed, but my thing is why go through the headache, send it early, well in advance so that you can get the receipt notice and proceed. Okay. Again, please be reminded that we are taking questions and you can use the Q&A tab on the webinar. Thank you so much. So Nunuvo, my next question is, how do you submit application? How does one apply? Okay, um, you, the base application, of course, is the application for the green card. Right. Many people have asked, uh, you know, a lot of people are aware of mm -hmm. the green card process through marriage where you have to file the I-130. Under the Liberian provision, you submit the uh, green card application, you submit it, along with if you need the work permit or you need a travel document you will submit those forms as well as we indicated uh the public charge rule doesn't apply mm -hmm. so you won't necessarily have to submit the form ia64 which would be what your sponsor will submit you know, uh, you know for you and of course you have to submit the uh requisite documentation to mm -hmm. submit the application and you mm -hmm. submit it to uscis now, be very note, uh, take note that when USCIS looks at the documentation, their criteria is to look to see if you are eligible. Right. We define that you are not eligible. Mm -hmm. Two things can happen. They can either send you a letter asking for more documentation, right. or they can deny the application. Uh, in the last couple of months, maybe not in regards to this provision from what we see, but in other applications, USCIS are not being as generous as they used to be in requesting for more evidence. This has been a regulation that has been passed last year where it's up to the officer to decide whether or not they will request more evidence or whether they will deny the application on its face. So um, keep note of that as well. Okay, thank you, Attorney Nubo. And you, you mentioned that you would advise if a person is applying to submit before the December 20th deadline, say November, but would you advise a person to self-apply? Um, from a legal perspective, I'll say no. 
from right. a human perspective, also as a general person, I'll say no. Mm -hmm. um, and here's the reason why. Um, Liberians um, have advocated and pushed for this for a very long period of time. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Liberians came close to getting something uh, like this, maybe in 2001, mm -hmm. but uh, September 11th happened and that would push on the back burner. Um, we, you know, as recently as last year, we saw how much of a push that was made to get this legislation done. Uh, my advice is that you're at the finish line. You know, you're about to cross the finish line. There's no need to start worrying about, can I do it by myself? Can I do this? What if I do it or what not? No, my advice is that you find a competent attorney Mm -hmm. or you seek the services of a pro bono uh, nonprofit agency that can assist you and walk you through this process so that you do it properly. The benefits uh, far outweigh whether I should do it by myself or not. This is not TPS. This is not DED. Even if you did all your TPS application by yourself, even if you did all your DED application, mm -hmm. this is the question you know, I wouldn't recommend it, you know? This is like, this is almost like uh, going to a doctor and mm -hmm. the doctor says we have the cure of cancer, similar to what you've been doing. My, rec my, I would say, you know what? The benefit of me getting this thing done and getting what I need far outweighs of testing and seeing, mm -hmm. um, you know, if I can right. do it myself. <laughs> okay, so you're saying basically that a person must get a competent attorney to handle the case. Correct. And the standing of a competent attorney is somebody who primarily practices US immigration law, has a good understanding of US immigration law and the skill necessary to represent the client, correct? Excellent, I would say yes. Uh, that is absolute on point. And also the reputation of the attorneys in terms of what mm -hmm. others have said. Um, you know, to be able to, you know, this area of law is complex and mm -hmm. different facets and different, um, as I would say, patches, patches mm -hmm. of law that have occurred over a period of time. And so you want someone who is not just dabbling in it here and there. Uh, you want someone who understands uh, and can sit down with you uh, and advise you on mm -hmm. um, how this will be done. Okay. Thank you, Ateneo. Well, I'll go to the open session to see some of the questions that we have from our audience. Um, if a person has, so one question that has been posed is, if I have a pending green card application with USCIS, can I convert it to the LRIF application? The answer is yes. There's a provision uh, in the uh, USCIS manual Right. If you have a pending application, say you have your spouse have filed for you or your parent, you know, or your child has filed for you and you say, you know what, I don't want to continue. I'd rather do the IRF, get my green card and then apply for my citizenship. The answer is yes. And the, you know, provision is to be able to communicate that or write that to USCIS um, and also provide uh, the evidence that you qualify for the uh, requested uh, transfer and then USCIS officer will review it um, and uh, can make that um, change. Um, you, can, uh, you can do it before uh, you get to the interview or you can do it at the interview. If it's something that you decide I want to do it, it's better to do it now um, and convert it. Um, I don't, and, and then again, I'm, I'm not quite sure if you, if, if you will receive a receipt notice back saying that it has been converted. Right. And so I don't know how, how you will be able to prove that you've met the deadline. So then mm -hmm. again, it has to be done early enough, or you may just say, I'm going to keep what I have and apply uh, to a second application for the LRF and then see um, you know, just to preserve my, you know, that right. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Newell. How about for persons who are currently in removal proceedings mm -hmm. or have a final order of removal against them, but are still in the USA? Are they eligible to apply? Very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, when the LRI first came out, it, that was not clear at all. 
my position from the moment that it came up was that the sole jurisdiction of the LRF right. with USCIS and the, and the law that was signed makes it clear that a prior removal order or in removal proceedings does not affect the processing and granting of this application. This is unprecedented. Usually what happens is that if you're in removal proceedings or even have been in removal proceedings, the judge has to grant you a green card or you have to reopen your case. This is not the case. A couple of months after, maybe a month after, mm -hmm. um, the Department of Justice came out with a clarification to say, yes, if you have a removal order, you're in removal proceedings, it does not affect uh, the USCIS ability to adjudicate uh, your application and upon approval, there are steps that you and uh, you know you can take to make sure that your case is closed. It also provides avenues and suggestions to judges who have cases coming up and the person is is qualified for this provision. Um, and depending on the applicant, you have to sit with your lawyer and decide do I proceed with my application that's going forward in court or do I proceed with uh, you know, the um, provision that will grant me a uh, you know, green card? Well, these are things that are technical and must be discussed with your attorney, but simple short answer, a removal order does not affect you, being in removal proceedings does not affect mm -hmm. the, uh, this application. Now, before, uh, just before you get, I would say the contents of your application mm -hmm. or the findings of a previous uh, hearing before a judge may impact whether or not you get granted, depending on whether or not the judge found that you submitted a frivolous uh, in a, a form, the judge may found that you submitted an application that was um, not, uh, uh, um, that you submitted a document that was mm -hmm. not truthful, or maybe you lied on a previous uh, form or application. Those are things that will, that will, that one, that your lawyer and yourself need to be aware of mm -hmm. uh, as you proceed with the LRF. As liberal and broad as this provision is, um, the ramifications of previous applications and the contents of those applications are not erased or they just don't disappear. Right. And that takes us back to our earlier point about finding a competent lawyer who will understand your case and then provide you the necessary advice and how to proceed, correct? Correct. Okay. I have an interesting question here. So the November 20th, 2014 date coming forward, is that continuous presence? Say I came in 2014, I left, I've been here inter intermittently. I've been here, say, on three occasions, I'm here now from 2016. I wasn't here fully from 2014. I've been here since 2016. Is this continuous presence or just? Yes, um, and correct. And the, um, the simple calculation is that have you been out of the US in the aggregate for more than 180 uh, days? So right. if you've been out for more than 180 days at any given point, you don't qualify. Um, secondly, even if you're able to sneak in or right. meet that requirements or whatnot, uh, according to the USCIS manual, you know, they could also inquire as to whether or not you really intended to maintain your residence here. So um, if the continuous presence is an issue and, you, mm -hmm. and you're able to kind of sneak your way in and make that argument, Right. Uh, that's one red flag you need to be aware of mm -hmm. that at the interview um, or, you know, that this may be an issue that the officer will press on. Okay. Let me remind our audience again, at some level, please give me one moment. Please be reminded that we have the Q&A session open and we are taking questions as I speak. Thank you so much. Just at any level, so if a person has been previously been denied a green card application, mm -hmm. are they ultimately barred from LRIF? No. If they're being denied a previous application for a green card, no. Well, uh, the question will be, well, why were they denied and, 
and you know what were the facts of the case? Were you denied because of a criminal record? Were you denied because of other things? Those are things that you want to look at. Um, you know, were you denied because the USCIS found that you were previously married to someone and that marriage was deemed to be fraudulent? Mm -hmm. That's another issue that you know you have to kind of look at. Mm -hmm. I think so. Blankly, no, it doesn't mean that you can't apply. In fact, for every for any green card application, if you're denied, it doesn't prevent you from reapplying if you can overcome the grounds for denial. Okay, and so I'm um, going back to our in ineligibility requirements. I know you are bad if two or more offenses, um, two or more convictions involving moral turpitude. So would a marriage fraud, a decision of marriage fraud, qualify as? Um, would, would that qualify under the, the, um, the, the ineligibility requirements? Yes, and that, and that itself raised another technical issue because in the right. matter of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the green card question, they were asking, have you ever lied to an immigration officer or, or have you submitted any fraudulent documentation, blah, 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 blah. Now, they were having in the record the fact that there's a finding of fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, there's two things. You know, is there a finding of fraud? What is that finding? And are you able to overcome uh, that finding of fraud or sham? And so, um, yes, that will raise its head. And that's something that you need to be aware of because, of course, under um, a provision, INA 204C, uh, that if there's a previous finding of fraud, it may prevent a subsequent. Um, a subsequent competition, but even though we don't have an I-130 form, which which would which the marriage fraud would then bar, right. we also have the general questions of have you committed any crime or any misrepresentation, and if that's the case, then you have the waiver mm -hmm. that you have to apply for, and which will be uh, determined based on the hardship to your family members as well as whether or not the USCIS officer feels that you are worthy of being granted a green card. And so, um, you know, that's something, because if the waiver application is denied, right. the, you know, the adjudication process stops and the green card application is denied. Okay, thank you. Attorney Nibo, what is the turnaround period for the application? How long does it take? Well, it's only been about four to five months mm -hmm. now. I mean, since January to July. So unless you applied exactly in January, you know, you're looking at five months. Um, it's too early to give you an update as to how long the actual approval of the green card is taking. In terms of the work permit and other things, mm -hmm. I find that applications that are submitted in January, maybe at the beginning of February, right. work permits were approved uh, quickly. Um, and we're still in the process of going through uh, the adjudication process. We've had some requests for documents asking for either valid passports or copy of birth certificates. Those are things that, you know, do come up um, from time to time. Not, not, not as many, but as I stated before, uh, in the manner of how you came to the U.S., how long you've been here, uh, you may have your birth certificate um, that you brought from Liberia, or you may have a recent birth certificate issued in the last year or so. Um, and one needs one will need to uh, explain why the birth certificate is so recent, and you also need, you know, most likely secondary documentation to prove um, your birth. That, right. I get it. Those are other technical matters that have come mm -hmm. up. Okay, I have a very interesting question here. Um, I think it has to do with dual nationality. So, an audience has a Liberian birth certificate and a Nigerian passport. So, their nationality is kind of split between the two. Would that person qualify? My argument is yes. Okay. You know, if the person is born in Liberia mm -hmm. um, and has a Nigerian passport, let's say from the mother. Mm -hmm. Um, they are like Liberian national. Um, this is stepping away a little bit from the U.S. law, but you also want to look at the provisions of what Liberia mm -hmm. says. 
mm -hmm. uh, about who qualifies as a right. Nigerian citizen and who must renounce, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, in the last a year or so, there have been a Liberian uh, decision that says that says Liberians who naturalize uh, do not lose their citizenship. Right. Constitution also refers to uh, Liberians who acquire foreign nationality on the basis of their father, mm -hmm. but not the mother. So those are things that, uh, in my opinion, uh, if the facts presented that the person was born in Liberia and acquired the nationality from the mother, et cetera, uh, my argument would be yes. Of course, the burden is on us to prove mm -hmm. that you are a Liberian national and that you qualify. Okay. So a follow-up to that is also another interesting question. A follow-up to that is that is because Liberian is a dual national state, correct? And um, or, or is it because the U.S. is a dual national state? nationality state. Okay, so to clarify is that um, the United States on mm -hmm. its face does not recognize dual nationality. Right. Now, if your home country uh, recognize you as their nationality, I mean, as their citizen or national, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. So if you are a citizen of Britain and you naturalize in the eyes of, of the US, you are a US citizen. In the eyes of Britain, you are a British national. Right. In the context of Liberia, mm -hmm. uh, prior to this, the um, decision uh, that came down last year, Liberians who naturalized mm -hmm. uh, lost their citizenship based on a 1972 law, which was contrary to the new constitution. Right. Uh, the courts came out and said that, nope, Liberians do not automatically automatically lose their nationality right. uh, if they naturalize. Uh, so is Liberia a dual national dual national state? Um, that's still up for grabs. Does Liberia lose their nationality <laughs> yeah. if they naturalize? Right. According to what the Chief Justice and the Justices says, says no. Right. So. Okay. So how soon can I naturalize if my LRIF application is approved? Well, I say if you get your green card mm -hmm. in the mail or you get your receipt notice, say this Friday, I will have my application the next Monday in the mail. And the reason for that is that two things. When your green card is approved, uh, there's this rollback. So either your green card will be effective as of the date of your initial arrival, or if you cannot prove when you arrive, it will be as of 2014. The regulation says that in order to become a, become a, nat um, a naturalized citizen, you have to have had your green card for five years. And so counting from November 2014 forward, you've met the five years and you're eligible to apply. Wow, that's so awesome. you have to meet the requirements of naturalization as well. But the, the criteria that you have to have being a lawful permanent resident for at least five years, um, is met. Mm -hmm. I guess that's one of the uniqueness about the LRIF legislation. Yes. Correct. Okay. So if um, a Liberian national applies for the um, LRIF, mm -hmm. is this concurrent with the spouse and children or must they wait to obtain their green card before they can file for any spouse or child? No, it can be filed together. It can be right. filed together. Uh, mm -hmm. So the thing is, you can file with your Liberian National Lead, as, uh, as I'll say, uh, and submit the application. Or when the Liberian National parent uh, spouse files, they can file after. Or after the, the Liberian National parent gets the green card, then they can also file. Okay. Yeah. So um, I have a, an interesting question from our audience. How soon can the spouse of a Liberian national file? So say I got married to a Liberian national three days ago mm -hmm. and he's about to file for the LRIF. Can I include an application for that spouse? Well, the, re the um, regulations and the clarification from the manual says that mm -hmm. at the time of filing, the, at the time of filing, the relationship must exist right and up up in the time that the application is granted so um 
if you got married last week, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're eligible. You're in. Right, a simple. Beauty of this provision, mm -hmm. um, you know. That's as simple as that. So if I got married a day yesterday, mm -hmm. I can still submit it from married to a Liberian national. All I need is documentation to show that I'm married. All right. Now, I will, um, that's correct. And you have to show proof of your, uh, your marriage. marriage. Mm -hmm. okay, now, I, it's not in the regulations or it's mm -hmm. not in the provisions, but I will caution that um, one should not just get married just to say I'm, I'm marrying someone so that they can get uh, papers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure 100%. Uh, knowing USCIS and knowing the officers that, I've, you know, that I know, the inquiry will be, you know, are you getting married just for the sheer fact that um, you want to obtain a national, uh, you want to obtain a lawful permanent residence and naturalization. So, um, just I'm just putting it out there so that right. you're aware that it doesn't excuse or waive those things. Now, mm -hmm. as I said, it's not in the manual, mm -hmm. but in the spirit of the law, mm -hmm. uh, and even on the green card application, I think they asked the question, you know, have you ever married mm -hmm. someone for immigration benefit, mm -hmm. which then triggers the inquiry from the officer. So even though the law may not, you know, uh, say that a spouse must prove that they are married for love and the intent to build a life together, on the green card application, there's a question that references that. Even if it doesn't occur now, mm -hmm. where it's not found, if you go through the process, you obtain your green card, become a citizen, and let's just say you divorce and then you remarry and file for someone else, that's going to pop up. And even if you're a U.S. citizen, uh, the government has the option to institute denaturalization proceedings because at the time you applied, mm -hmm. you misrepresented that fact. If it's found that the marriage to the Liberian national uh, was just a team, uh, a green card. Immigration benefits. Okay. So Thank keep you. Keep that in the back I... of your I have another interesting question here. Actually, I have never thought about this, but at any level, what happens if an eligible Liberian national is in the U.S., however, um, his spouse or children are back home or outside the U.S.? Very good. How does that work? Yeah, it's... Uh, Very good. Yes. Um, <laughs> my interpretation of that is that um, there's not a provision for what we call consular processing. Mm -hmm. where the applicant's family is outside of the U.S. and then based on the application, they then um, process the uh, paperwork for them to go to the embassy. Mm -hmm. um, they have to be in the U.S. They have to be present. Um, you know, how bad is it? I, I would say not too bad because when the person gets a green card and naturalizes, then they can begin the process to bring their their spouse and their family members into the U.S. But the way how the law is written and how the regulations are provided, uh, that hasn't even been addressed. Right. You know, or if there was a mechanism, how that will even be, you know, triggered. Right. So in that case, that's a new rule. It means that that person has to obtain their green card and then do a family petition for exactly. um, relations outside. Right. Yes. Right. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, if the spouse and family members are able to travel to the U.S., you know, uh, then that's a, then that's, that'll be a whole other uh, issue. Okay. To discuss about. okay. So let me just take one more question from, from our open session and then I'll go back to uh, the questions I have on my clipboard here. Mm -hmm. So if a person has, let's see what the person says. Okay. If I have an order of deportation, mm -hmm. would I need to have my case reopened before submitting the LRIF? Um, the general answer is no. no okay. You don't have to get your case reopened. You can submit your application, and if it's approved, then basically you um, proceed with the judge to get it, you know, removed. Right. There's a there's a, a interesting also component uh, because for those who are in removal proceedings. Uh, and then trying to naturalize, there's an issue of whether or not you can have a deportation order and naturalize, depending right. on the circumstances. So, of course, uh, 
my uh, take on that is that at some point you have to go back to uh, the immigration judge and, and reopen and there are provisions for that. Another thing is that if you have a deportation order, is what are the contents of that order? What's the contents of why the application was, denied, uh, mm -hmm. was denied? Uh, you may have to discuss with your attorney to be to create or develop a, a creative legal strategy on how you could possibly reopen those removal proceedings to correct whatever decision or findings were made, especially if it involved misrepresentation or alleged fraud or anything like that, uh, because that may come up mm -hmm. and that may present, you know, and you know, present an issue. Um, the good thing about applying early and having at least an application file is that even if the application comes back you know, and is denied for some other reasons, if there's a way how to fix it, you've already met the sunset requirement and so that you, you, know, you can resubmit. So, um, right, I understand you. Consider. Again, that brings us to our point that you need to find a competent attorney to review your case and then provide you with the best advice. Correct, correct. Now, and finding a, a competent attorney is being able to sit down with your attorney and discuss. I mean, you know, you can sit there as an adult. You, may, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand, but you can ask questions and mm -hmm. how the person you know, explains those, those questions to you and how they're able to navigate and develop a, a strategy will give you a good idea as to whether or not this makes sense versus someone who says, yes, you qualify, just apply. I mean, you know your case history, you know maybe there are things that you put in your application that you say, you know what, I listed my nephew and my nieces at the time when I first came, how will that affect me? I listed you know, all these people in there, mm -hmm. but when I apply for TPS again, three years afterwards, they weren't in there. What do I do? Um, I wouldn't just say, yeah, submit your application, apply, see what happens. My thing is that those are questions that based on my years in practice, I've seen that USCIS have come to ask questions. Right. Why did you include these people in there? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and not here because don't forget when you sign the application, you attest and you swear on the penalty of perjury that everything is correct. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking at the black letter of the law, if you include information, you say, well, my cousin told me to put it in there. That's not going to be a sufficient answer, especially in this environment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking at this environment, looking where there's a push to curb the immigration. Right. Yes, the president has signed this provision, but it, it still hasn't changed the way how USCIS has okay. proceeded. And USCIS have stated clearly that they're not, they're not, they're not a customer service agency as what used to be seen. They are there to protect the integrity of the system and make sure that the benefits are given to those who, de uh, who deserve it. Right. Um, that's sense. a clear indication that um, easy walk in the park, you know, doesn't mm -hmm. exist anymore. Right. Makes sense. Okay. Let me go back to my clipboard here. So what if a person cannot afford an outstanding outstanding new goal? What would you advise? Um, well, my thing there that there are a lot of resources around mm -hmm. in nonprofit agencies. We have Catholic charities, we mm -hmm. have uh, nonprofit uh, groups within the Washington, D.C. area around the nation that can assist you. You know, uh, if there's anything, there's a lot of nonprofits there. I mean, one can only look back when Liberians were advocating for the extension of DED, yeah. how many nonprofits mm -hmm. and churches came up. So if you can't afford an attorney and you're desperate, there are means, there are nonprofit groups. You can even contact your church and say, look, pastor, reverend, how can you help with this? Can you reach out to groups or can you assist? The right. same way how Liberians were able to galvanize the same way how we can do it. There's also the fee waiver request where you can apply for that. Mm -hmm. um, but in my opinion, there's no, there's no excuse. Any, any decision not to apply because you don't know, you're not quite sure, you can't pay your stuff, it's reckless. <laughs> I understand. 
Um, thank you, Attorney Nivo. So my next question is, what are the costs associated with submitting this application? I was speaking in regards to the filing fees. The filing mm -hmm. fee is 1225 and that includes right. the application. And the work permit application is all included into that as well. As long as the application is in process, you can continue to renew your work permit application without having to pay the filing fee. Depending on the law firm, in terms of legal fees, it depends on your case and it depends on what you desire and the type of service and attention that you desire. Um, of course, you know, um, you know, there are many attorneys around, vary in price depending on their competence, their experience level. Uh, those are the decisions that you will have to decide and how comfortable you are mm -hmm. um, in proceeding with a different law firm. Right. So if um, a prospective client wants to retain our services, um, must they necessarily be in the DMV area? No, uh, they do not. Uh, we have clients all around uh, the 50 states, even before this uh, pandemic happened. We had clients around the 50 states in the U.S. Um, and overseas. Uh, mm -hmm. We meet with our clients by Google, Hangouts, Zoom. Uh, we have the tech tech technological um, yeah. uh, systems in place to meet with our clients. We've been doing this uh, for uh, you know, years, even before the pandemic. And so this will just continue with it. Of course, with the pandemic and social distancing, we are relying heavily on our meetings uh, virtually, um, mm -hmm. but we will engage in a consultation with you to fully ascertain um, your history and to make sure that we gave you the proper advice uh, moving forward. Okay, let me just remind our audience that we have resource materials available and the link has been shared in the chat room as well as in the Q&A section. Please feel free to access these materials and um, you will be validly informed. Tanya, so a person wants to book consultation with a firm um, and because of this whole coronavirus pandemic, I'm sure we are not taking people um, walk-ins mm -hmm. at this time, correct? Correct, correct, correct. So it will be done by Zoom. Um, and I require an in-person, I mean, excuse me, I require a consultation. Right. The main reason is that um, I'm able to ask questions and get more information. Uh, there's one thing about submitting an application. Mm -hmm. There's another thing from, from then seeing, oops, well, you didn't tell me that. Um, my um, experience have been that even if the client says, you know, this is the only thing, nothing else has happened, um, I always, always have the consultation and I make the same evaluations. Um, the point of view that I'm looking at things is different from the client's um, point right. of view as well. Um, as you know, I've, I've had enough experience with, with the officers to know what they are looking for. And you know, basically they are trained to suspect fraud. And so every question that they're asking is to ascertain whether or not this person qualifies uh, for this application. They're not there to be your friends. They're not your friends. They don't want to be your friends. They're there to protect the integrity of the U.S. Um, uh, laws and system. So uh, if I'm going to represent you and right. advocate zealously on your behalf, I have to be convinced and know what are your weaknesses, what are your strengths, mm -hmm. and where I can proceed. Right, correct. Plus, every case is different and most most of the prospective clients will think that, oh, it's just this general application. But I understand that at the consultation, when you probe these clients, that's when you find out, oh, it's actually not just a standard application. There's actually some, a few nuances that we need to iron out before. Exactly. Right. And, then, mm -hmm. and, and they're there, uh, they're, they're, there's, there are, you know, several, you know, there are questions you ask. Yeah. Uh, you know, one point I'll give out to librarians also is that, you know, the question becomes, you know, uh, if you are a Liberian, if you have been in the U.S., you haven't applied for TPS, you haven't applied for DED, but you qualify. Mm -hmm. The question, if I'm the officer, will ask, is like, have you ever claimed to be a U.S. citizen? Mm -hmm. Why am I asking that? Maybe it could be that your name um, doesn't automatically suggest that you're foreign. Maybe you've lived here long enough that your accent, you can easily mask your accent. 
And the question I want to know is that if you have worked, how were you able to work? Mm -hmm. And did you ever claim to be a U.S. citizen to kind of bypass? Uh, did you present your social security card, right. your driver's license, knowing that you have a way you know, in? Those are probing questions that we'll be asking, not necessarily about the LRF, but I'm looking around long term down the line um, so that I can advise you and dig deeper into what I know about the law and, and how we can navigate. Right. So just one more question. Uh, um, an audience wants to know if we do pro bono services pertaining to the LRIF. Um, that is on a case by case. Uh, a lot of my pro bono cases comes through uh, nonprofits. And so I have a relationship with nonprofits that mm -hmm. take on a certain amount of cases through them. Those cases have been vetted. Those mm -hmm. cases have been decided whether or not they actually need pro bono services. And so uh, pro bono services is not something where you, you can just choose and say you get the pro bono right. service. There has to be a need and verification of that as well. So, um, okay. Thank you, Attorney Nouveau. Um, I'll take your last words and then we wrap up. Yes. Yeah, so, well, uh, thank you very much. I mean, the hour has gone by, mm -hmm. uh, you know, much quicker. I could sit here and keep talking more and more about uh, the provisions and what you think you need to be aware of. But I hope that this webinar has kind of gave you an idea on what this is about. And what I want you to take away from this is that there's no need to be afraid to apply. There's right. no need to say, you know, listen to uh, the street lawyers on telling you this is what you need to do. Do not do this. It's better to pay for a consultation with a lawyer and the lawyer tells you there's no way than to listen to a street lawyer or to a family member as much as you may respect them and then find out next year that you cannot. Uh, I mean, that you had the chance and you missed that opportunity. You, don't want to miss, you, you, you do not want to do that. So uh, take heed. Um, I wish you all the best of luck. And for those who will reach out to me, should I have the opportunity to represent you, I will be honored. But I hope this has given you some idea on what the processes are to at least get you started. So thank you very much. Have a great day and uh, God bless. Okay, before we go, thank you so much for joining us. Please feel free to call us at 301-562-7995. We are ready to assist you. We are more than happy. We are equipped, we are ready. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you so much.